for my first interview, we are going to talk about cancer. And actually, we'll call it Cancer 101. And with us today, we have a nationally and internationally well-respected oncologist, Dr. Stephen Rosen. And Dr. Rosen is the provost, cancer center director, chief scientific officer, and director of the Beckman Institute at City of Hope in Duarte, California. And he's also my husband. So anyway, welcome, Steve. So happy to have you here for my first interview. And I'm honored to be your first interview. <laughs> you know, the most dreaded word in any language, I think, is cancer. It's very frightening. I'd like for you to give us an overview of cancer. It's um, People know that it's a malignant tumor, cancer, uh, a, a cell that's kind of gone crazy or whatever, but they don't think of cancer as being many cancers, but just one type of cancer, and so I'd like for you to talk about that. Well, cancer is an uncontrollable growth, and uh, usually this uncontrollable growth can also invade tissues and then spread to other organs. It can start in any organ in the body. It can start in the brain, the breast, the lung, the, the gastrointestinal tract, which is the colon, or the stomach, or the liver. Uh, it can be in the kidney. Uh, there is no organ that cancer doesn't develop in. Uh, some areas are more common than others. The most common cancers in the United States start in the lung, and that's uh, followed by uh, the breast in women and the prostate in men. Uh, gastrointestinal cancers are also very common and they can affect both men and women. Uh, some cancers we can cure, uh, many we can control, uh, but there are some cancers that have really have been uh, great challenges and we haven't been able to make a significant impact over the last few decades. The new buzzword in medicine is precision medicine. How, do you, how does that play into oncology today? So you'll hear the term precision medicine or personalized medicine. In this instance, we're talking about analyzing a individual's cancer and coming to a conclusion of what may be the most vulnerable aspects of that cancer that allow us to effectively treat the malignancy or what we refer to as the cancer uh, and minimize side effects to the person. Uh, historically, if an individual presented with lung cancer, everyone will be treated in the same manner. And a small percentage would benefit, and a large percentage of individuals would have no benefit from the intervention. Uh, with precision medicine, we're trying to be more precise to personalize the treatment so that we can actually enhance the number of individuals who will have a, a positive result from those uh, that we won't be able to help. You began your career in 1979, up until now, and you know I just happened to mention that I, as a nurse, took care, the majority of the patients that I saw had heart attacks, stroke, bleeding ulcer. You didn't hear about cancer as much as you do now. Everybody seems to be touched by cancer, either personally they've been diagnosed or a loved one has been diagnosed. And I would just like for you to talk about that. So the actual statistics have not changed dramatically in that regard. It's the population has aged. Uh, it used to be the life expectancy was about a decade less than it is now. And cancer is a disease of aging. So in part, you're seeing more cancer because of the aging phenomena. Uh, there are cancers that have increased in incidence, and there are a number that have declined over that period of time. Uh, the most profound changes have occurred in the blood cancers, which is my area, that's leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, where we now have more effective treatments. We don't have early detection, but more effective treatments that diseases that had a very limited life expectancy that can be extended, and many can now be cured. In the solid tumors, uh, there have been a variety of things that happened over this period of time. Uh, there's been enhanced early detection, so you can catch a cancer earlier and cure it in a stage prior to it spreading. Uh, the 
most uh, remarkable advance actually happened before that. It was the pap smear, where you can pick out abnormalities in the cervix before a abnormal growth became a chronic cancer, and mm -hmm. so you can attend to it and uh, cure the disease. Uh, there was uh, mammography for early detection of breast cancer, colonoscopy for early detection of colon cancer. Uh, these were advances that had an impact on, uh, in some instances, the incidence of the cancer. In the case of colon cancer, you picked it up as a polyp before it became a chronic cancer. Mm -hmm. In the case of breast cancer, you picked it up before it was um, invasive in some instances or when it was in its earliest stage that it could be cured. Uh, unfortunately, there are certain cancers that we still are challenged by because we can't detect them early and they tend to spread uh, before we're actually able to make a diagnosis, and that's uh, true of pancreatic cancer, uh, many lung cancers. They tend to be in silent areas where there's no uh, adequate screening at this juncture. What about, I have to throw this out, because I, there are a lot of conspiracy theorists who believe that there is a cure for cancer and that the medical community is not sharing that information because cancer care is so lucrative. What do you say to those conspiracy theorists? Well, they're ignorant. Uh, that's ridiculous. If I was able to come up with a cure of cancer, regardless of what the cancer is, if my motivation was to either be famous or wealthy, that would happen. And, and, and so there is no hidden information. In fact, uh, scientists and clinicians rush to publish what they find because that's how they get promoted, that's how they become distinguished, that's how they got their recognition. Uh, I would say that the challenges are that there are causes of cancer that we haven't been effectively able to interfere with, uh, ranging from tobacco use. Well, to actually, you know. It Let's talk about the causes because tobacco use used to be the number one cause of cancer and that has been replaced by? Obesity. Yeah. And then what are a couple of the other causes? So if you uh, look at the primary causes of cancer, uh, anything that damages our DNA, our chromosomes can potentially lead to cancer. And anything that causes cells to replicate because then they are more prone to develop these alterations in the DNA, which makes up the chromosomes. And that has to happen before you have a, a cancer. Uh, those insults are associated with the development of cancer. So uh, radiation causes cancer. And it could be radiation like the atomic bomb, which led to leukemias developing a later mm -hmm. point, but it also sunlight causes melanomas or skin cancers. Uh, there are environmental toxins. Those tend to be less common, but they still can cause cancer. Uh, historically, benzene was one of the examples, again, uh, causing a form of leukemia. Uh, you have tobacco causes damage to, again, the DNA and chromosomes. Leads not only to lung cancer, but cancer in many sites uh, within the body. But it turns out if 10 people uh, smoke two packs a day, uh, only two of the 10 will develop lung cancer and it tends to go in families because there's also a genetic component that affects cancer. In this case, it's can you repair the damage, but there are also genetic abnormalities that lead to cancer. Mm -hmm. In some instances, because again, you don't have the capacity to repair damage. Uh, obesity, we talked about that earlier. Uh, we don't know in all honesty why obesity and, obesity and nutrition are associated with cancer, but they clearly are of multiple organs. It may be uh, that it's because there's enhanced replication of cells because of aspects of the diet, uh, or it may be that as a result of obesity or um, one of your premises leading to uh, pancreatic abuse is that there's inflammation, and mm -hmm. inflammation leads to oxygen being presented to cells in a manner that it can actually damage DNA. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it has to be damage to DNA that leads to cancer. And the more cells that are replicating, the more likely that uh, can occur. But and you also have uh, 
uh, infectious causes of cancer. These are often the sexually transmitted cancers or transmitted by uh, blood transfusions. And uh, examples would be hepatitis causing liver cancer, hepatomas. Um, you have the uh, papilloma virus, human papilloma virus that causes cervical cancer mm -hmm. and also can cause cancers of the head and neck area. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of speculation, but not definitive proof about the Epstein-Barr virus, which is associated with mononucleosis mm -hmm. causing lymphomas, lymphoma. mm -hmm. and, and so that's a, a, another issue. But so, then, I was just going to say is that you had mentioned hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer, and what about the birth control pill? Because that's also hormonal, yeah. even so, though the lower doses, but what are your thoughts on that? So there's no question in my mind that the birth control pill, when taken for a prolonged period of time, uh, increases the risk of breast cancer, decreases, ironically, the risk of ovarian cancer because there are fewer ovulations against less cells dividing. Uh, but there is an impact on breast cancer, not as profound as historically was the case with the higher amounts of estrogens, uh, but what still What about fertility issue. drugs? Uh, there would be more speculation, but my suspicion is that it can increase the risk of breast cancer. So, okay. Um, so women that take hormone replacement therapy or the birth control pill or have taken fertility drugs should be very vigilant about self-breast exams and mammography, would you say? Uh, we don't have enough data to know whether or not there should be different guidelines in terms of when you start screening. You know, all women, it's advised that they be screened when they reach the age of 40. Uh, whether or not someone who took uh, birth control pills uh, or fertility drugs should be screened at an early age, we just don't know. Okay. And then when we were talking about obesity before and how important, you know, um, it all begins with what you put in your mouth. Um, Dr. Otto Warburg in 1921 Let's talk about his discovery. So Otto Warburg was a scientist in Germany, and he discovered that cancer metabolizes or handles sugar, glucose, in a different manner than normal cells. And it was a less efficient manner, and the question was why, and it turned out that we now know that the sugar is being used to produce, rather than energy, which is what normally happens in a cell, to produce what we call biomass, DNA, proteins, fat, so cells can replicate. And that's why if you inject into a patient with cancer, sugar that is radio labeled, it's called a PET scan, it goes to the cancer, the cancer takes it up more effectively and you can see it. And so Otto Warburg was the individual who described this phenomena. It's called the Warburg effect and he received the Nobel Prize as a result of his work. We now, uh, are trying to develop therapies uh, that affect the way glucose is taken up in a cancer cell uh, to enhance the killing of the cancer cell. Uh, there's also a possibility that by uh, manipulating diet, and this is the case in animals, uh, there's some provocative data in humans, not proven, uh, that if you can keep the glucose level lower, uh, you may impact on the ability of cancer-killing drugs to kill the cancer. And uh, there's also some provocative data that individuals, after being treated for cancer, who maintain a healthier diet with a lower glucose may have a lower relapse rate. Mm -hmm. This is not uh, proven definitively, but uh, there's enough compelling data that people need to continue to study it. And don't patients with uh, someone that's obese, morbidly obese, okay. that's diagnosed with cancer, isn't it difficult to figure out if the dosage, the chemotherapeutic dosage for that particular cancer is therapeutic because of weight issues? That's another challenge we have. Uh, you would think it's simple to figure out what the proper dose is for an individual. Historically, uh, when we dose individuals with cancer therapies, it's uh, based on their size and an arbitrary dose, but 
the reality is just about every patient handles the drug differently, uh, whether it's because of um, the amount of body fat they have or the enzymes that are involved in metabolizing the drug mm -hmm. or their level of either um, liver or kidney function. Um, that is a, an area that continues to evolve. Uh, we be, become more sophisticated in doing those analyses, which are important and historically have been somewhat ignored. Uh, but it remains a great challenge, and we honestly don't know the proper dosing to this day uh, for individuals who are the same height but of vastly different weights. Mm, interesting. Stay tuned for more on Cancer 101.